This is the Keswick Convention. A convention means a gathering and a coming together. It is a beautiful thing that God has brought us together this week, brought us together to enjoy one another's company, yes, and to hear His Word and to receive His blessings as we heed that Word together. That's true whether we're here in the main tent, watching on one of our relay venues, or joining us online. We are brought together by him. Please continue to keep uh, bringing news to us through that hashtag KESCON23 link. We look forward to hearing more from you over this day and beyond. Now at the start of our gathering together for this morning Bible reading, let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you that you are the great giver, the giver of the Lord Jesus the one who gives your spirit, spirit who gives gifts to those to whom Christ has given. Thank you for daily bread. Thank you for all that this convention needs being given from your hand. We ask now that you would give to us, each and every one of us, as you will, as a generous Father. Please give us what we need. Thank you that you give us more than that with rejoicing. May we share in your rejoicing, in Jesus' name. Amen. We read in Philippians chapter 2 of how Jesus humbled himself. He clothed himself with flesh. And then he became obedient to death, even death on a cross. And after that, it says in verse 9, Therefore God exalted him to the highest place, gave him the name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow. We're going to sing praise to that King, Jesus, above all things, the name above all names. Let's stand as we're able.
The aim of being human is indeed to crown the Lord Jesus with our thanks and with our praise. We have sung his praise. We now have an opportunity to join together in giving thanks to God. As we come to the end of this convention week, we want to give collective thanks and praise to God. Some of us will have given financially to fund this event and the ongoing work of Keswick Ministries. We want to give thanks to God as we bring that offering to him. Many of us will have given ourselves in in relationship and an encounter as well as in service this week in love of neighbor. And we want as well to commit that in our thanks as an attitude of life towards God. As we persevere, as we've heard this week, with lives hidden in Christ that are thankful through him. So how can we mark this giving of ourselves and our resources as a convention gathering? I'm going to invite you as you're seated, as you're even joining us online, to join together saying aloud with me some words from 1 Chronicles 29. Originally words of a prayer of David, but a prayer for all of us who are in Jesus in great David's greater son. So, please, join with me in these words aloud together. David praised the Lord in front of the whole community. He said, Lord, we give you praise. You are the God of our Father Israel. We give you praise for ever and ever. Lord, you are great and powerful. Glory, majesty, and beauty belong to you. Everything in heaven and on earth belongs to you. Lord, the kingdom belongs to you. You are honoured as the one who rules over all. Wealth and honour come from you. You are the ruler of all things. In your hands are strength and power. You can give honour and strength to everyone. Our God, we give you thanks. We praise your glorious name. It's wonderful in that moment of quiet as well as we end there to express our thanks to God. And all God's people said, Amen. Well, it's pretty hard to follow the reading of God's Word, but anyway, I'll, I'll do what I can. Uh, as we come to the end of our morning Bible readings, we wanted to finish by um, selecting really the, the best that we've read on, uh, on being human, our bodies, sexuality, and how we engage with those. And so, uh, some highlights from, from the team that, uh, that we've pulled together. Of course, we've, we've mentioned a couple of times Ros Clark's book, human, and this really does set a great foundation on what the Bible teaches in how we're made, how we're to live, and how we as humans have the amazing privilege to be able to um, have a relationship with Almighty God. This is a a great starting uh, place, and as I say, we'll set a really good foundation. You can buy it individually or in the pack that we mentioned earlier on in the week. And then Sam Albury, who was with us uh, last week doing the Bible readings, and you can catch up on, on those with a whether you buy the USB stick or you watch online, but his book, What God Has to Say About Our Bodies, just taking it to that next level, a little bit deeper, but not too complex at all. The book is in three parts. We're created, we're broken, and we can be restored. And working through those gives us a good understanding of of what the Bible teaches about our bodies. And I think it's good to be reading this so that we can be engaging and talking with our friends. It can be hard, can't it, at work. We're we're always being silenced in so many ways, but to speak up about what the Bible says. Those two books will help you do that. Now, as we seek to select the best books from across the publishers, it doesn't always mean that two authors might agree or come to the same conclusion, but within the biblical framework, we want everything that we sell to hold to the Bible and be pointing to Jesus. Two books that perhaps come to slightly different uh, conclusions within the biblical framework are, are these two, Preston Sprinkle's book, Embodied, and then Matthew Roberts' book, Pride, looking at, at sexuality, same-sex attraction and, and the, the 
the biblical uh, perspective on, on those issues. I think Preston Sprinkle's got some really interesting things to say that will just perhaps uh, help us consider how we frame what we say to, to our friends. And then uh, Matthew Roberts' book, Pride, the first half is quite hard work. But I do think in the second half, there are some very serious questions that are raised that I think within the church, we do need to think through and perhaps talk through uh, with, with those in our church family. So two books that I think will help you there. And then finally, um, Kelly Capic, You're Only Human, and why it's a good thing that we, we're not God and there are limitations. Now, you may think, well, that, <laughs> that's going to be a really happy read. Um, but um, no, this... Um, this is an encouraging read to see the limitations that we have and why God has created us in that way. I, I mark and underline, and he has a, he, he has a turn of phrase of, of saying things that are very helpful, very fresh. And I'd encourage you to get this and be encouraged that we do have limitations. Our bodies don't do everything that we might want, want them to do or even that they used to, but that is a good thing under the authority and creation of God. So some gems that we, we've picked out. Come and talk to us if you want to, uh, to ask anything specific about them, but get something good that's going to help you thinking through this issue of being human. Thanks. We do want you to keep catching up with the Keswick Convention as this week comes to a close. There is week three yet to come. If you're heading home, if you're already at home, then YouTube, podcast, talks library online. They're all great ways to find talks from this convention and previous years. A resource that will keep on giving to you and to your churches and to others you can point them towards. Also, if you want to take the convention home with you, a great keepsake, a gift for those who can't be here, then there's edited versions of convention talks, seminars that you can use with your church at home. You can get it on a little UB, USB stick. There's an order form on the stand at the back of the tent or over in base camp. Keswick 2024. Um, in God's goodness, we're already making plans towards next year event where we're planning to explore together the theme of resurrection. There's some little cards. You can see one on the screen there that you can pick up at the end. Uh, week one, David Gibson bringing our Bible readings to us, Andrew Satch book for week two, and Vaughan Roberts in week three. A wonderful theme that will feed us over the year ahead. Please do take those cards with you. Point people to our website and encourage others as we pray and look towards that. As you pray and look towards it, could you be one of the volunteers that we need for next year's event? If you were here last night, you heard it takes 650 volunteer roles each year to support this event in a variety of ways. That could be you. It's a great way to join in with a team for a week or more, to serve God's mission at the convention, and to be encouraged by spending time with God's people, seeing God's word at work. Please do uh, volunteer in that way. Indeed, if you're local around Keswick and you'd be interested in joining us for a week or more over the year to look after the pencil factory site, then please visit the KM stand at base camp or pick up one of the volunteer cards that's available on the way out of the main tent this morning. One person we couldn't have done so well without this week would be Jonathan Griffiths, who's been bringing our morning Bible readings to us. This morning is the last of those. I'm so thankful when I see Jonathan appear backstage each day before this meeting begins. I'm so thankful as well as I hear him speak to us. Jonathan, thank you for the work you've put in in preparing for this week. Thank you for pointing us towards the Lord Jesus. On that Monday, Jesus holding all things together. And then also thinking as well about um, over this week how we are found completely in Christ. Thank you for that. And I'm going to ask you now if you can show your applause to Jonathan.
We've shown our applause to Jonathan. Please do encourage him if you see him around. Please encourage him in a moment as I uh, pray for him and for our Bible reading. Before that, though, I'm going to be joined on stage by David Price, who's going to come and read this morning's passage to us. Uh, David is a wonderful convention goer. I often see him down here on the front row. Thank you for coming up on stage <laughs> and being ready and willing to read the scriptures to us. Wherever we are, front row, back row, on a venue elsewhere, watching on screen, let's join together as I lead us in prayer. Father, thank you for the riches of your word. Thank you for treasures old and treasures new. Thank you the storehouse is full. The bounty is generous. Thank you as humans, we are creatures of your word and fed by your word. Please may this be a feast now as David reads to us, as Jonathan comes and speaks and preaches to us. Please, we open our hearts before you as our ears are open. In Jesus' name, amen. Colossians 3, reading from verse 12. Put on then as God's holy ones, holy and beloved, compassionate hearts, kindness, meekness, humility, and patience, bearing with one another. And if one has a complaint against another, forgiving each other, as the Lord has forgiven you, so that you also must forgive. And above all these, put on love, which binds everything together in perfect harmony. And let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, to which indeed you were called in one body, and be thankful. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly, teaching and admonishing one another with all wisdom, singing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs with thankfulness in your hearts to God. And whatever you do, in word or deed, do everything in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. This is the word of the Lord. Thank you, David, for reading for us so helpfully and so well. It really has been a very special privilege and a very special delight to be with each one of you this week and to be in the Word of God together. I think Keswick is a very special gathering and a very special convention that makes a very special contribution to the life of the church in this country and beyond. And we just feel so grateful to have had the opportunity to be part of it this week. It's been a real delight to catch up with old friends and to make new friends and to be reminded that we share so much together in the Lord Jesus Christ. I said to Gemma last night, you know, when is it this side of heaven that we're going we're gonna to have this kind of a gathering with so many dear friends who we love so well? And we paused and reflected on it for a moment. And, um, and Gemma said, you know, I think the, the next time we would see this group of people together among friends and family would probably be your funeral. <laughs> and I thought about that for a moment. I thought, I think I'm going to enjoy Keswick a little bit more. <laughs> so we'll make the most of what remains of this. But it really has been a delight. And it is a rare privilege, isn't it, for us to spend sustained time, to take this time apart and to be in the Word of God day by day, morning by morning, in the wonderful seminars, uh, in the evenings as well, and to be so richly fed from the Word. It's a lovely thing to have that sustained time, that time apart. And I, I don't know what is the situation to which you'll be returning when you go home, if you go home today or tomorrow or into next week. But we know, don't we, that there will be both challenges and opportunities that are before us. Some of those we'll be aware of now, some of them the Lord knows, but we don't yet know. But it is my prayer for you that there will be some key things from this week in the Word of God that will prove to equip and sustain you for that which is yet to come. We're in Colossians 3 and the passage that was read for us. Far too often we hear reports and we hear accounts of dysfunctional churches. 
of unhealthy Christian communities. Many of us will have had unhappy experiences of Christian community at some point or other, experiences that have brought disappointment and worse. We've all heard the reports, there have been too many of them of late. Many have lived through stories that you would sooner put behind you and and forget all about. And and while many of us will have been part of good and life-giving Christian community, and many of us will feel we've got so much for which to give thanks, we are aware, aren't we, all of us, that crises and challenges abound, and many of our brothers and sisters, many here, are the walking wounded, having experienced church hurt and even church trauma. For each of us, in all our churches represented here in this great gathering, we know that we're, we're far from perfect. We know that as churches, we have much to learn. We know that we need to grow in grace. Now, I take it that all of us want to foster wholesome, flourishing, and life-giving Christian community. If we're followers of Jesus Christ, that's the only kind of Christian community of which we want to be a part. But how do we do that? How do we do that? How do we pursue healthy Christian community together? What do we prioritize? In the power of the Holy Spirit, what are we to do? We need help. We know we need help. Where do we begin? Paul has been very hard at work in this section of Colossians, teaching us how it is that we are to pursue holiness, how it is that we are to grow in godliness. And increasingly, his focus has been, you may have noticed this, his focus has been on how we do this together, corporately, as a community of the people of God. In the opening verses of chapter 3, the focus was really on what we need to stop doing, what, what it is we need to avoid doing. But here in our passage today, Paul turns to the positives, what we must embrace and seek to do through his strength. And as he sets these things out, he actually gives us a framework for building and nurturing healthy, God-honoring, life-giving Christian community. If we would be churches that flourish and that enable the flourishing of each believer, here is what we must be, and here is what we must do in and through the power of the Holy Spirit, four things in particular. First, put on love for the people of Christ. Notice it again with me, verse 12. Put on, then, as God's chosen ones, holy and beloved, compassionate hearts, kindness, humility, meekness, and patience, bearing with one another, and if one has a complaint against another, forgiving each other as the Lord has forgiven you, so you also must forgive. You know, one of the the great surprises and disappointments of the Christian life is the discovery that other Christians can actually be quite difficult. (laughs) Difficult to get along with. You know, the discovery, and it's real, isn't it? The discovery that relationships within the Christian family can be immensely challenging, that brothers and sisters, yes, can sin against one another, that interactions among believers are often far from simple and far from straightforward. Yeah, it's a tough reality check for each one of us when that truth dawns. But if you've been a believer for any length of time, if you have participated in Christian community in just about any context, in any place, you will know that this is just how it is. You will know that this is the truth. The reason for it is, of course, that we still have our old sinful nature within, what the Bible sometimes calls the flesh. You and I, we are still works in progress, each one of us. None of us has reached complete godliness or perfection, we have, our, we have our rough edges, don't we? We have our sinful inclinations. We have our blind spots. We have our flaws and our failures aplenty. And if you take a big crowd of saved but still sinful people, or a small crowd of saved but still sinful people, and you put them in a room together, 
and you bring them together in community, there is going to be messiness and even occasional misery. That's just how it is. And so, by the way, if you are on a great quest for the perfect church, and you are currently dotting around from church to church rather discontentedly, I, I don't want to disappoint you, but you need to know that that quest will fail. That quest will fail because you will not find the perfect church. And you know, God in His wisdom, He hasn't taken away all the problems and all the pain, but He has rather called us called us individually and corporately to navigate the sometimes choppy waters of church life with godliness and with dependency upon Him by His Spirit. As our passage sets this challenge before us, it begins with gospel truth and gospel actuality. We who know Christ, verse 12, are God's chosen ones, those upon whom He has set His saving love not for any merit of our own, but because of His own boundless grace and unfathomable wisdom. We are, says Paul, holy, not because we've done good things, but because the Lord Jesus Christ has made us holy by His blood. He set us apart from the world to be God's own possession. We are beloved, says Paul, Loved of God, not because of anything lovely within us, but because God has poured out His saving love in Jesus upon us through His grace. Chosen, holy, beloved. I think it would be worth our while to try and remember that trio. Let's try and hold on to that as we go on from this place. Let's actually give it a little memory aid tied, tied to our time here at Keswick. This is, let's try it, see if this helps, the Cumbrian Hills Bank, okay? C-H-B. This is our spiritual bank to draw upon as we go away from this place. We are C-H-B. We are chosen, holy, beloved. I was looking for the Barclays in the Market Square that was here last time I came. I, we bank at, at Barclays, and I needed to go in and do something. I'd been waiting to do that, and I noticed it's all boarded up. Everywhere I go, the Barclays is closed. I don't know if you've noticed this. They don't seem to exist anymore. I'm, I'm a Luddite. I don't much like the app. I like to go in. It's all gone. But here's another bank that is here, and there are resources upon which we can draw. Cumbrian Hills Bank, CHB, chosen, holy, beloved. This is who we are. These are the gospel facts and truths concerning that which God has done for us if we belong to Christ. And friends, the fact that we are loved like this, the fact that we are God's chosen ones, made holy through the costly work of Jesus at the cross, beloved in Him, the fact that God saw all our sin and failure from eternity past and yet determined that He would set His love upon us even give His own Son to save us. You know, that changes everything. Has it truly sunk in for you in your heart and mind that you are loved like this? Truly loved? Do you know and believe today that God really loves you? Some will struggle with this because you haven't known love from others as you might have known it, as you should have known it. If, if you know the Lord Jesus by faith, you are beloved of God, loved truly, loved deeply in Him. I think we all recognize the fact on some level that when a child has not had the benefit of a loving start to life, the benefit of a secure home where they know the love of parents who really and truly care for them and adore them, when in place of love there has actually been neglect or abuse, it's so hard for that person then to love others later in life. It's, it's harder to love a spouse, to love children. It's not impossible to learn, of course, praise God, but it's a hard thing, isn't it? We, we learn to love by being loved. We are enabled to love through first experiencing love. But if a person has experienced love from others, has been well-loved 
it's difficult then to excuse in them a lack of love for others. If a person has known only love from parents and love from family and love from a spouse and then turns around and is unloving toward their family to their own children, it's not only disappointing, it is unseemly. It's inexcusable. Well, you and I, friends, we are those who have been deeply and radically loved by God at extraordinary cost. It's no mistake the way in which Paul structures the call of verse 12. His aim is to get us loving one another properly within the family of God, but he's careful in the way in which he's issuing his call. He's very strategic, actually. Every word here is loaded. Put on then as God's chosen ones, holy and beloved, compassionate hearts, kindness, humility, meekness, and patience, bearing with one another. You know, it's hard to escape the call when we have been loved like this. When, when you and I have been given a full account at the Cumbrian Hills Bank, when we are God's CHB, chosen, holy, and beloved, and Paul knows that it's hard for us to ignore the call. Now to the details then of what we're called to. In Christ, God has given us a new character and a new power, all of which comes from Him by His Spirit. And we are to put on that which He has given us. We are to put on compassionate hearts. Now, we don't easily, you and I, look on the struggles and the pains of others with hearts of compassion. That's not necessarily natural to us. We naturally focus, first of all, on our own needs and our own hurts, and all too easily we overlook the heartache and the need of those all around us. But the God to whom we belong looked down from heaven upon a sinful and a dying people, and what did He do for us? He sent His Son. The Jesus, to whom we are united by the Spirit, looked out on a needy people, and He had compassion upon them, as you will remember, because He saw that they were as sheep without a shepherd. And Paul says, put that on. Put on that heart of compassion. Put on God's own heart of compassion. And with that, put on kindness, says Paul. Not harshness, not judgmentalism, kindness. Put on humility, he says, not pride, not a sense of self-sufficiency or self-accomplishment or self-congratulation. No, put on humility. Put on as well meekness, not making much of yourself, not demanding the roles that are in the spotlight, but being ready to be of little account, to serve, to deal carefully with others, and not out of a sense of your own ego or importance and not to be noticed. And then with these things, he says, put on patience, patience, how you and I need that. You know, we want, we want things to go our own way, and we want them to go our own way now. Church life, community life among brothers and sisters, it takes a lot of patience. And I think that we find that particularly hard because we've got high expectations of other Christians. We, we expect other believers to understand the truth as we do. We expect them to be mature as we would view maturity. We expect things to go smoothly and easily within the family of God. And when they don't, as often they don't, we are very, very prone to become impatient. But patience is what it's called for. Patience reflects the heart of God who is so very patient with us. The God who delays His judgments because He is patient and desires that none should perish, who bears with us in all our folly and our sin and does not disown us when we deserve to be disowned. And in that same spirit, then, we are to bear with one another and even forgive one another if one has a complaint against another. And if we struggle to do that as often we may, we have to take note of the pretty heavily loaded reminder Paul gives us of our own need and of our own standing in verse 13, forgiving each other as the Lord has forgiven you, so you also must forgive. Notice that there. It's not you also might consider forgiving if the conditions are all right, and if they say all the things you want to hear. No. As the Lord has forgiven you, so you also must forgive. 
Here's the bottom line when it comes to our attitude and our disposition toward others in the family of God. You and I have been forgiven so much. We have been shown so much grace. We have been treated incalculably better than our sins deserve. Now, friends, that is simple gospel truth. It is the foundation of everything for us, but at the same time, we so easily forget it. We so easily forget it. When it comes to our interpersonal relationships within the church, when it comes to a situation where we've been offended or we feel that we have not had the treatment that we deserve, when we see the failure and sin of another and want to call them to account, suddenly within that dynamic and within all the hurt, we forget that we've been forgiven so much and we've been, for, we've been forgiven so often and we've been forgiven with such patience and with such grace. We forget that we rest personally on the undeserved mercy of God that's true of all of us. But then we, we, we turn around and we refuse to extend the forgiveness to others. And as we do that, here's the thing, it's a denial of the gospel, pure and simple. No, we need to put on the gospel truth that is ours in Christ. We need to live and behave as a redeemed people as the Lord has forgiven you so you also must forgive. Now, there are lots of relational pieces that Paul has just set out here before us. Compassionate hearts, kindness, humility, patience, forgiveness. But, you know, they, all, they hold together. There's a wonderful unity to them. I don't know if you or perhaps your children have ever made anything with uh, hammer beads or parlor beads, as they're sometimes called. I wonder if you can picture those little plastic beads with hollow centers. And if, if you can picture those, you, you take these little colored beads and you place them on a, a plastic base, a shaped base with little spikes. Perhaps it's shaped as a, a car or a train or a heart. Maybe that's apt here, a heart. And then when they're, when they're all in place, you, you set a sheet of wax paper over them and you press down with a hot iron. And they, and they melt together, fused into the shape of whatever the design is now permanently bound together, and, and you take the fused beads off the plastic base, and you have a, a colorful uh, heart, or whatever the shape is, a special little plastic blob from the children. They can be used very briefly as a coaster or something <laughs> before it's disposed of quietly uh, when no one's looking. Parents in the gathering, you know exactly what I'm talking about. Children, I'm very, very sorry. <laughs> you can make more. <laughs> Notice with me what it is that holds all the beads together in what Paul is saying here, verse 14. And above all these, put on love, which binds everything together in perfect harmony. Put on love, says Paul. And again, we don't naturally overflow with love toward others, especially toward those with whom we have differences or disagreements, especially toward those who have been difficult, frustrating, rude, hurtful, those who have let us down and worse. But God is love. And we know that, we know that to be true because God has sent His Son for us to be the propitiation for our sins. We've experienced his love, and now in Christ we are united to this God of love, and his spirit works within us to enable us then to love. There is now a new fundamental reality that unites us together with other believers. We are now together, his chosen ones, holy and beloved. We are brothers and sisters in Christ. And the family relationship and the family dynamic binds us together in an unbreakable way. Above all these, put on love. And so I wonder, how is it going for you? How is it going for you seeking to love your brothers and sisters in Christ? I, I wonder how it's going for you seeking to have a heart of compassion toward those in need and those in distress. I wonder how easy you are finding it to show kindness to them, to interact with them in humility. I wonder how easy you are finding it to be meek in the midst of 
a situation where other believers are perhaps failing to do the same themselves. I wonder how easy you're finding it truly to be patient when some brother or sister is sorely testing your patience. I wonder how easy you are finding it to bear with other believers who are being difficult, challenging, obstinate. I wonder how easy you are finding it to forgive perhaps when you've been wronged and deeply hurt by a brother or sister. I guess for most of us, if we're being honest, at least in key seasons of challenge, the answer will be, I am not finding those things easy at all. I'm not, I'm not finding that easy. It, I'll tell you the truth. I'm finding this really hard. It's really hard. Now, I think that's the truth of it. For many of us here, you will be finding this very, very hard at the moment. We can all relate on some level. And so here is our invitation together. Here is our challenge. We must put on the characteristics that belong to God and our ours in Christ. We must draw on the account that we share together, a family account at the Cumbrian Hills Bank. Chosen, holy, beloved. We're, we're a chosen people, not for any merit of our own. And because of that, we then learn humility toward one another. We seek to bear with one another. We're holy people. And so we seek to be godly in our behavior toward one another, holy, set apart. We're, we're, we're a beloved people, and so we put on love. We're forgiven people. And so we learn to forgive. Now, I see evidence of these things within our own church family in Ottawa. I see it there. I'm, I'm thankful. I expect many here will say that you've seen these things in your own fellowship, and you do see them, and you're thankful. But at the same time, no church, no, no local fellowship can claim to have mastered this. All of us, we've still got a way to go. We still have plenty of room to grow. I don't need to know anything about your own church and your own situation to know that that much is true about your church. And so I want to urge you to imagine here with me for a moment a church family, a fellowship of believers where verses 12, 13, and 14 were truly being lived out with perfect consistency. Let me read the verses again and just imagine in your mind's eye what that kind of a church would actually be like. Put on, then, as God's chosen ones, holy and beloved, compassionate hearts, kindness, humility, meekness, and patience, bearing with one another, and if one has a complaint against another, forgiving each other. Can you imagine it? What a church that would be. What a marvelous community to which we could belong. Put on love for the people of Christ. Next, let the peace of Christ rule your heart, verse 15. Notice it with me. And let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, to which indeed you were called in one body, and be thankful. It's interesting here, in a section in which Paul has focused on relationships within the church, that he should emphasize peace within our hearts. You see, I read the call, let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, and I immediately turn to think of my personal concerns and the implications for me. You know, if God gives me a deep sense of his peace, I'm going to sleep better, I'm going to be happier, and so on, which no doubt that's true. But Paul is thinking about the whole body of Christ. He's thinking about the fellowship. He says so in verse 15. This peace is the thing to which we were called in one body. And so we are prompted, aren't we, to consider the nature of the connections here. And we don't have to ponder for too long before we gain some insight. Here's something I've, I've observed, and you may have observed it too. When a person within the Christian family is, you know, making waves, causing some disruption, maybe even picking some fights, is caustic in tone and full of unjust criticism, and I'm, I'm afraid this does happen in churches from time to time, when an individual is behaving like that, I've come to see and discern over time that there is usually something else going on in their heart and in their life. You know, the presenting issue is rarely the underlying issue, the fundamental issue, the real issue. You ever notice that? 
And the need is not to satisfy their immediate issue or complaint. The need is actually for God to do a work in their heart and to bring them to a place of true peace in Christ. But if the peace of Christ rules the heart, well, then we're in a totally different place. Now, this is a bit of a different context, of course, but just to drive home the point and to see the dynamics, if you were to think of a leader of a nation who was a real warmonger, and I won't name names, but history has provided us with some awful examples of these people, but you think of a ruler who is a brute and a bully who stirs up strife and conflict in the region and in the world, and then imagine for a moment how different the world would be if the peace of Christ ruled in that individual heart. I mean, imagine it. The world would be transformed. Lives would be changed. I've often thought that in times of conflict, this would be such a wonderful thing if this leader who is just bent on war, if he only knew the peace of Christ. What a difference. Now, the context different here in Colossians 3, of course, we're thinking of the local church. We're thinking about interpersonal relationships there. But we see the truth of what Paul is driving at, the logic of it. If Christ's peace rules the heart of the believer, community relationships are vastly changed. To fully grasp what Paul is talking about here, we need to consider the multiple dimensions of the peace of Christ just for a moment. Think about that with me. Foundationally, Jesus is is the one who gives us peace with God through His redeeming work at Calvary. Romans 5.1, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. That's the essence of the gospel. It's the foundation of everything. Then, having been set at peace with our Maker and our Judge, the peace of Christ allows us an experience of inner peace, the kind of peace that lets us put our head down on the pillow and sleep at night, knowing that despite all our worldly concerns, all our failures and all our sin, despite all those things and more, all is well with us if we know Christ. You know, if When peace like a river attendeth my way, when sorrows like sea billows roll, whatever my lot, thou hast taught me to say, it is well, it is well with my soul. Well, that's that's the peace of Christ, but then this Christ who gives us objective peace with God and a subjective experience of peace within, He then teaches us and requires us to live at peace with others. He enables us to do that by His Spirit. And so, Christ, who is our Lord, He causes His peace to rule, and that's interesting language, to rule within our hearts. You see, His peace is a comprehensive whole. It comes to us as a gift of grace, but here's the thing, just as we need to put on the kindness of God, so too we need to allow the peace of Christ to rule. We need to submit our worries and our cares to Him and take hold of His peace. We need to submit to Him our inclinations to demand our own way, to push and to spar. We need to submit all that to Him, and we need to allow His peace to rule. You'll notice the extra instruction at the end of verse 15, which looks actually a bit like a throwaway, but it is, of course, closely linked and be thankful. You see that there. Let the peace of Christ rule and be thankful. Now, when we're in a state of turmoil, gratitude quickly disappears in the rearview mirror, doesn't it? You know, I'm I'm worried and I'm chewed up about something and I I can't see anything to be grateful about. I'm I'm in a state of conflict with another believer and it, you know, it's obviously all their fault. (laughs) The Lord hasn't shown them the error of their ways and I'm just, I'm too grumpy to feel thankful for anything. No, no, no. Let Christ's peace rule your heart. And as you enjoy his peace and submit to his peace, remember with gratitude all that you have and all that you enjoy in Christ's forgiveness, cleansing, power by the Spirit, fellowship with other believers, hope for eternity, and be thankful. Be thankful. If we would flourish and we would be healthy as a people of God. We must allow Christ's peace to rule in our hearts. And next, we must let the word of Christ dwell within. Verse 16, let the word of Christ dwell in you richly, teaching and admonishing one another in all wisdom, singing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs with thankfulness in your hearts to God. 
You know, building a healthy community is never simply about the avoidance of conflict and the prevention of harm. That, that's true in the secular realm, and it may be helpful just to think in those terms just for a moment. When we build towns and cities and communities, we don't just invest, do we, in crime prevention. So we don't simply just you know, build up a police force and install locks on the gates and doors and security cameras to monitor the activity. That's not where community building begins or ends. That's a kind of precondition for being able to build a community. You need harm prevention measures in place. But community building goes way beyond that. It considers how to invest in people and to help people actually flourish. It involves building schools and libraries and parks and centers for the arts and recreation and so on. Now, when it comes to Christian community, when it comes to the church of Jesus Christ, Paul is not simply concerned with harm prevention with maintaining peace and healing conflict. Those things are preconditions for health and flourishing, but they're not the end game. No, Paul wants us to see that a healthy Christian community is a place where each member of the community is actively invested in the flourishing of all the members. And the means for this is not through programs or facilities primarily. It is through each person individually and the church corporately being deeply invested in the Word of God. It's about each individual and the church as a whole having the Word of Jesus Christ dwell within us richly. Where we live in the city of Ottawa, the winters are brutal and cold, but the summers are lovely and hot. I think it's nearly 30 degrees in Ottawa today. You know, summer is actually um, summer. <laughs> Much as we love the English summer, 16 degrees, cloud and drizzle. <laughs> it's, it's very charming. It's atmospheric. <laughs> and Canadians, Canadians know how to make the most of the brief summer to squeeze out every little drop of, you know, vitamin D or whatever it is from the sun to enjoy every moment. And what lots of people do is they build swimming pools in their garden. Some put up these, these, um, <clears throat> these above-ground ones that are kind of flimsy. Some dig out a swimming pool. But it's, it's, it's quite common because everyone's like, I've got to make the most of these six weeks of warmth before it drops to minus 35 again. <laughs> and uh, and it, it's a fun thing. But in, in caring for a pool like that, one thing that needs to be done is to ensure that it's, it's, it's a sort of healthy environment that the sanitizer level is kept appropriately high, chlorine or bromine or whatever it is. That's essential, isn't it, for health? You know, you let that drop, and then lots of people swim in the pool. A big group of unwashed kids from the youth group comes around and spends the day in the pool, or maybe a, a little rat gets in there and drowns. Maybe a family of frogs gets sucked into the filter. And if the water isn't treated properly with chemicals up at the right level, soon what you've got is a swamp in your back garden. You see, you need a cleansing agent permeating that water at a good level for it to be a healthy swimming environment. The other thing that our summers are good for in Ottawa is for, for farming in our region. It's wonderful farmland all around us. We're, we're surrounded by very, very productive farms in our region. Now, if you're a farmer growing crops in your field, one thing you need to do, one responsibility you have is to ensure that you have a rich mixture of fertilizer permeating your so soil if anything's going to grow there. You need to keep the nutrient levels nice and high or you're going to have a measly unhealthy crop. Now, I mentioned those two images because the Word of God both cleanses and nourishes the people of God. It is both a sanitizer and a fertilizer for the heart. And if we are to be a healthy Christian community, a healthy church, a people who are fighting sin and growing in grace, here is what we need. <laughs> Here's what we desperately need. We need the Word of God to be dwelling richly within up at the right level. We need to keep ourselves saturated with the Word. We've got to keep the levels up. 
to go back to the chlorine image for a moment, you know, one of the things about it is that it's actually a daily thing to monitor the levels. Someone lets that go for two, three, four days, there will be murky water in their, in their back garden, algae. There will be trouble brewing. We need to be topping up with the Word of God regularly from multiple angles. I referred to this last time, but here it is again. Here is what we need to give our attention to, our own Bible reading, our, our family Bible reading, our study of the Scriptures with others, the hearing of the preaching of the Word, benefiting from music that edifies every input we can get from the Word so that our lives are daily saturated with the Word. But having the Word dwell in us richly, it enables us to minister the Word to one another. And what here results is a kind of virtuous cycle. Notice what we're to do, and this is all of us, middle of verse 16, we are to be teaching and admonishing one another in all wisdom. Just let that sink in for a moment. All of us within the church family are to be engaged in the ministry of the Word to one another, taking opportunities to teach and apply the Word, even to admonish from the Word, to speak the Word of God into the lives of one another in formal ways and in informal ways as we have opportunity. It ranges from teaching a Bible class or a Sunday school class or leading a, a small group to, to sending just a word of encouragement that's grounded in the Bible, to, to giving a quick phone call in times of difficulty and speaking gospel truth to a brother or sister who needs to hear it. And notice how else our lives to, are to overflow with the word. Notice that they're singing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs with thankfulness in your hearts to God. Here's another aspect of our ministry of the Word. When we get together on Sunday and sing, we're meant to be singing from an overflow of the Word of God that dwells among us and within us. We're to be singing gospel truth, Bible truth. Our singing is to overflow with the Word and to be an overflow of the Word. And it's an expression of the Word. And of course, that's the joyful experience, isn't it, that we've had this week together as we've been so very well led in song. This is huge. There's a whole theology of corporate worship here. We're not going to try and unpack it all, but it's, it says to us, doesn't it, that what we sing together on a Sunday or at special times like this, what we sing must be an expression of Bible truth. It must be a form of the ministry of the words. And just notice where our singing is directed. I think it's fair to say that there are two directions of focus here. Our singing is linked together with our teaching and admonishing of one another. So there is, there is a horizontal focus as we sing to bring benefit, to bring encouragement, edification to one another. We are to be singing Bible truth to minister to one another. It's a lovely thing to do. But we are also to be singing with our hearts lifted to the Lord, with thankfulness in your hearts to God, says Paul. And if you like, that's the vertical direction we sing to one another, and we sing to the Lord. There we go, 30-second theology of corporate worship. But it's so rich, isn't it? I mentioned earlier the virtuous cycle in all this, and what I mean is this. As God's Word dwells in us richly, as we are saturated with the Word, we are able then to minister, to teach, to speak, to sing the Word to one another. And as we do that, guess what happens? The Word dwells more and more richly among us. The virtuous cycle. And friends, this is a picture of healthy Christian community. This is at the heart of what it means and what it looks like to be a wholesome, flourishing Christian community. And within all this, we each have a part to play, each one of us. Individually, we've got to take care to saturate our lives with the Word of God. How's that going? How's that going? What other entry points could you put in place in your life to get more of the Word of God into your heart and into your mind? We then need to be thoughtful and energetic in finding ways to speak the Word to others, to teach and to admonish. Where are you doing that? Where is your opportunity? Are there more opportunities that you could take? And together, we need to be committed in our local fellowships, in our churches to ensuring that every aspect of our life together is word-saturated. 
every ministry function, every event. Fill it with the Word. Seek to ensure that all the ministry is Word-driven so that the Word of Christ will dwell in us richly as a people of God. And as churches, we need to keep that commitment. We need to guard that focus. Yeah, it's so easy. It's so easy to get distracted. So many calls upon church life. So many priorities we could embrace. But here is the way of flourishing and of health. It's remarkable and very wonderful to see what happens in an individual life, in a family, and in a church where the Word of God is simply released to do its work, where the Word of God is simply placed at the center thoughtfully and prayerfully, where it is read, where it is heard, where it is considered. You see, the Word of God will do the work of God in the lives of the people of God through the power of the Spirit of God if the Word is simply given its rightful place. That's, that's how flourishing happens in Christian community. That's how health is achieved. Let the Word of Christ dwell within. Fourthly and finally, just as we close, if we would grow healthy communities... Flourishing churches, here is what we must do. Do all things, says Paul, in the name of Christ, verse 17. And whatever you do, in word or deed, do everything in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through Him. We have various representatives of various companies to, who come to our home, I guess as you do in your home, to do the work of their company from time to time. You know, the, the gas company sends their rep to read our meter and occasionally to perform some maintenance or some repairs. The rep comes along in a gas company van wearing a, a uniform and a little name badge. He or she reads the meter, conducts the maintenance, and then generally leaves. Similarly, the electric company, you know, they come. They check the meter. Maybe they do a locate on an underground cable or something else they need to do, and then they leave. There's a company that comes and sprays the lawn for weeds and things. I don't know. The company pickup truck, uniform, they arrive, they spray, they put on a little sign, and then they, they, they leave. Now, if the gas company came and offered to spray the lawn, or the weed guy came and delivered a pizza, or the electric guy offered to clear out our gutters, we'd look at the company car, we would look at the uniform and at the badge, and we'd wonder what on earth they were thinking of. You represent a particular company. You come under a particular name, and there is a limited range of appropriate activity that you can conduct under that name and wearing that uniform. Now, Paul is making a very simple point, very simple point in verse 17. You and I, we represent the Lord Jesus Christ. We belong to Him. We serve Him. We would save a great deal of grief and trouble for ourselves and for one another if we operated consistently under a simple principle. When you speak and when you act, make sure, please, that you are properly representing Jesus. You and I, we need to make sure that we are only doing and only saying things that are appropriate, fitting for His servants, His representatives in the context of the local church. If you and I make a point of only saying and doing those things that we can truly and honestly do and say in Jesus' name as His representatives, claiming that these words and these actions are consistent with His character and with His will, what a lot of grief we would save ourselves. Isn't that right? You see, I, I, can't, I can't take you aside for a quiet bit of nasty gossip about a brother or sister and claim that I am doing that in Jesus' name. None of us can go and plot a, a mini rebellion against our church leaders and claim, well, we're doing that in Jesus' name. We can't lie to one another in Jesus' name. We can't grumble and complain and pretend that we're doing so in Jesus' name. We can't humiliate or exclude a brother or sister and claim to do it in Jesus' name. We can't do that. Now, friends, if all our activity and all our words within our churches, it, within that, if we stopped and asked, can I say this in Jesus' name? 
Can I do this in Jesus' name? Can I claim to be serving and representing him as I do and I say this? If we just stopped for a moment and asked that question, we would actually, I think, turn back from so much that we do and so much that we say. And notice just briefly that Paul adds the note of thanksgiving, end of verse 17. In every word or deed, not only do we resolve to act and speak in Jesus' name, but we resolve to give thanks to the Father through him. Again, that's actually a wonderful guard for us. Father, thank you. Thank you that I have this opportunity to speak to my sister in Christ. Thank you that I have this opportunity to serve my brother. Now, if I am actually intending in my heart of hearts to slander or to undermine or to serve my own interests, I'm stopped short at that point. I can't thank the Father for the opportunity to do that. The tone and the tenor of the whole thing is wrong, and I know it. The the Father hasn't given me this to do as a servant of Jesus. I can't do this thing as an overflow of gratitude to the Lord. No, I I, I must hold back. I've got to repent. I've got to change course. We hear horror stories, don't we, of Christian communities that have turned sour, that have become places of profound hurt and even destruction, churches that have lost their way. How can we be guarded? How can we be protected? How do we pursue health and flourishing? Well, we first remember who we are, friends. We are CHB. We are those who have an account together at the Cumbrian Hills Bank, God's chosen ones, holy, beloved. And remembering who we are in Christ and all that he has given us in the Savior, here are four things we must do in our local fellowships, must pursue in our churches with the help that only Jesus by his Spirit can provide. We we put on love for others. We, We let our hearts be ruled by the peace of Christ. We let his word dwell richly in our lives and in our fellowship, and we do all things in Jesus' name. Let's pray together as we close. Father, what a privilege it is to be part of your family, adopted into your family through the Lord Jesus Christ and his saving work at Calvary. And Father, we know our failings and our weaknesses and our sinfulness as fellowships and as churches and communities. We thank you for bearing with us in grace. We pray that you would help us to heed your word and by the power of your spirit to live as your people in a way that reflects the gospel and brings honor to our Savior. For we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. Oh, Amen. What would our Christian communities look like if they were characterized by the love of Christ? I'm going to sing to close these words. Father-like, he tends and spares us. Well, our feeble frame he knows. In his hands he gently bears us, rescues us from all our foes. Praise him. Praise him widely as his mercy flows. Shall we rise to our feet as we sing praise to him?
As we praise, as we're gathered together, please take a seat. And as we praise and as we gather together, it might well be that the Lord is laying on your heart something to pray through this week, perhaps something from a seminar or a talk you heard or a conversation earlier in the week. At the end of this meeting, as on other occasions, our prayer team are over at the right at the front of the main tent here. Uh, to meet with you, to listen, to pray with you. Please remember there is a final meeting of this week of the convention here tonight to close off this week together. We'll see you then, we trust. If it happens that you're traveling home after this meeting ahead of then, then travel well. And in God's goodness, may we see you, may we be gathered again here together next year. May he bless and keep you in your daily walk with him ahead of them. And now, a final prayer for us together. A prayer for us as we are truly human in Christ, chosen, holy, beloved. Father in heaven, thank you for loving us truly and deeply in Jesus. Lord Jesus, thank you that you are the Prince of Peace, that it is your peace that longs and wants and will, according to your will, rule in our hearts. We want to submit to your peace our worries, our inclinations, our concerns. And so may your Spirit guard and guide us. May he cleanse our churches. May he dress us in fruitful virtues across our lives with love over all. May he saturate us with your word. May that word surround us in the call of the gospel. And may we speak thankfully, 
truth, gospel truth, in love to one another. All in Jesus' name. Amen. Let us go for the glory of the sun.